Welcome twos and threes. As always, pleasure to have you with us gathering here. Um, today, we have a real, real privilege to actually introduce you both Gavin and Paula Daniel, people who are near and dear to my heart. I have the privilege of working closely with at Kingsway, um, the school where I'm working at. Um, and I just think you're really going to love actually who they are, their heart, and actually the mark of God's grace and goodness and faithfulness in their life. Their story is just marked by, in so many instances, of the goodness of God. And I'm thankful, so, so privileged that you guys are actually here today, actually uh, blessing us with that opportunity to hear that and that you're willing to share that. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. One more thank you, three more thank yous. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, as usual, as per usual, we'll start off with our intro. So, Christine, if you don't mind. Cool. Two or Three Gathered is a series of conversations with Christians, brothers and sisters, considering their efforts and contributions to the kingdom vocationally, their stories and testimonies of God's sovereignty and grace, and an opportunity to tackle the relevant issues the church faces in the 21st century. In this, we seek to equip the saints by networking within the body, starting the conversation around often taboo subjects and seeking to develop unity across Christian denominations and traditions by opening up discussion on worthy, necessary topics. We want to help educate the wider body of Christ by asking these experts and people of wisdom across multiple fields the hot button questions and sophisticated questions that we believe there are answers for in God's church, but that there is not necessarily always access to. We want to further the growth of knowledge and wisdom in ourselves to worship God with our minds and fellowship with all of you as we collectively seek to discern what God glorifying discipleship looks for us in our respective vocations and in our spheres of influence. It is our heart and hope that Christ himself would be in our midst as we converse about things we believe he himself is very interested in. Welcome twos and threes. Thank you for gathering with us. <laughs> um so guys that's that is our intro um thank you again for actually coming on five more thank yous they're going to feature a lot in this podcast i think <laughs> <laughs> um we're we're so excited to have you on and to actually share a little bit about yourselves but before we get into the meat you know let's maybe do some milk um can you tell us a little bit about who you are maybe actually what our connection is how we've met each other um and yeah just you know more generally just Maybe we'll ask some, you know, icebreaker questions like every, say, church youth group does, you know, three truths and a lie, two truths and a lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you gonna go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, um, well, I'm uh, Gavin Daniel, and uh, I'm a teacher at a school called Kingsway School. And um, yeah, uh, so Jared and I are colleagues at, at that school, uh, but I think we've become more than colleagues, we've become family. Um, in the sense that we've been, we've uh, formed a relationship with his dear wife and his little children and his extended family, and so um, it so it goes beyond just working together. Uh, interesting thing about Jared and I is that we have our regular walks, where we two guys take a walk at lunchtime and talk about life and just listen to each other and 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 share. And uh, I think that's such a beautiful thing that that we do. Um, and so, yeah, I'm glad to be here today. That's awesome. More guys need to do that. Guy walks. I like it. Yeah, I, I should yeah. qualify. Like, you know, it's a lot of Gavin listening to me whine. Like, he's very pastoral and very wise. <laughs> oh, and you're <laughs> such a whiner, Jared. Like, period. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, it, it's it's about being a good listener, and then and then and then just coming in at the right point, you know. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And a uh, lovely Paula, Paula please. <laughs> so um, I'm Gavin's wife, <laughs> and uh, we've been the better. The be <laughs> we've been married for uh, twenty six years this wow. year. And um, yeah, we, I also teach at um, Kingsway and um, I have two favor in that I get to teach next door to my husband. Uh, our classrooms are next door to each other. So it's That's pretty cute. awesome. I'm living the dream. 
<laughs> oh, no, actually, I'm living the dream because while I'm busy teaching science, sometimes there's a knock on the door and there's a, a, a beautiful cupcake or a hamburger or something that comes in and, <laughs> nice. and then the kids in the class go, no, that's not fair, Mr. Daniels, you get favored. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, she's my wife, so, you know. <laughs> and she's the cook, so what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so um, I started relieving initially at Kingsway, and about four years ago, I uh, started full-time. I had the privilege of um, meeting Steph, uh, Jared's lovely wife, at um, while I was relieving, and I think it was uh, her first year at Kingsway. And uh, we just kind of just formed this instant friendship and uh, not only with her, but with her mom as well. And um, I think- Wait, 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 wait. does Steph's mom work at Kingsway as well? Yes. This is like a whole little Christian commune thing going on here that I am not a part of. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, feeling a little bit oh, left yeah. out here. Wow, I didn't, even, I didn't even know Steph worked there as well. So there we go. Yeah, My there goodness. Wow. And um, just um, basically just started doing life uh, with Steph. And I think Anne is one of, one of my best friends in New Zealand. And um, she's more like a sister to me. And um, yeah, and I had the privilege of baking Jared and Steph's beautiful, uh, for their beautiful their wedding, wedding, their wedding yeah, cake. Right. And yeah, and so, um, yeah, and the engagement cake. And the, engagement cake. <laughs> and the baby shower cake. And the I'm feeling like I'm yeah. missing out on several cakes here. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm forming a list. <laughs> oh, we, we, we should say that because Paula, you used to like, you used to professionally make cakes, isn't that correct as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when I um, when I lived in South Africa, mm. um, I had when I was pregnant with Jonathan, I decided that I couldn't have my last baby, and be uh, you know working full time and mm. yeah, but that's another whole story altogether, mm. and how I got to eventually leave teaching and I had my business running for about five years. Mm. and um yeah and then we moved to come to new zealand mm. yeah. So, yeah so paula literally gave up teaching and start, started her own business which became really really successful mm. um if you wanted a cake from paula you had to book three months in advance otherwise you would not be able to get a cake Wow. So, yeah it's wow. true. <laughs> do you have an instagram of your cakes i love looking yes, at professional I have cakes. An instagram. <laughs> oh can we yeah. link that below? Yeah. Because if there's anyone like me <laughs> who needs to see cool cakes, we need to link that, I think. <laughs> okay. So I can go yeah. check Thank them you. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm aware because like we I, I we obviously know each other, Paula, Gavin, and like um already you've endeared yourself to Christine, but uh, you know, for the sake of our dear listeners, I, I wanna give us a sense of trajectory. So like um there's there's obviously a sense in which your story was distinct as you were you know younger and then actually where your story converges but i'm wondering if you can like yeah just talk to some of these things um that add with a bit of a timeline and you know we can actually uh yeah. pick up on some things as we go like because you mentioned um south africa like it's wow. curious to me like i've never said this to you like um it amazed me getting to know you guys that i didn't know that there was a south african indian community like uh no, I oh. didn't. Shows my total naivety, uneducated. Ignorance. Us. Like, <laughs> I know, I know, the worst. <laughs> but, like, good. but I've I've always been fascinated. Like, if I wanted to ask you more about that, like, um, yeah. just yeah, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit, like, going right back, um, yeah, tell us a little Let's bit. Let's do about... pre-marriage, the separate stories yeah. before you met. Let's do it. Let's do it. What was it like? <laughs> Paint the picture for us. Were you living in a South African safari with the lions out the back, and you know that's how I imagine yeah. it is anyway. Uh, yeah, so I grew up wrestling lions, and uh, yeah. knew it. And, yeah, yeah. Knew it. I still have the scars, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, yes. I believe you <laughs> totally. I'm there. The life was tough, there. You know, you 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 just stepped out your door, and then you don't know what what what's what you're gonna encounter. Elephants, you know? lions, bears. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> Bring us back down to earth, Paula. <laughs> so I was born um, during the apartheid era. And uh, apartheid, for those of you that don't know, means apartness, um, separate. Uh, all um, race groups were separated in terms of where they lived, um, where we schooled, um, that kind of thing. And um, I was raised in a very orthodox Christian family and um, very strict. Um, in terms of we used to have Sunday school examinations. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Otherwise, so, you don't go to heaven. If no. you fail, is that it? <laughs> You're out. You're now, oh, yeah. wow. Gosh. So, Jesus, um, he's a hard headmaster. <laughs> so I think that um, church, I kind of grew up in the church because my dad was an elder and my mom was a Sunday school teacher. And I come from a family of, um there were six of us um i had i had two brothers i lost a brother uh, about 25 years ago and um i have i'm the third so i had my older brother uh reg and then my sister yvonne myself and my brother elton and um my parents divorced um when i was nine and that was, a, there was a huge kind of stigma attached to my mom, because at the time we, um, we, we lived in an Indian community and that was looked um, down oh. upon, it was frowned upon that, you know, there was divorce. Was and that also so, from, sorry, was that also from the, the Christian um, no, side I as think well? that's from the Indian side. From the Indian side, oh. okay. Yeah, more, from, more, cultural, more yeah. cultural. Right, okay. <laughs> So uh, my mom had a very hard life um, raising us. She had worked two jobs and, you know, um, we didn't really have much of a relationship with my dad and not because my mom stopped it, but because my dad was just not interested. That's hard. And um, yeah, I, um, it was hard being raised with people kind of look at you differently, you know? And, um, but I had, I have an amazing family whom um, we're very close to. I come from an extremely close knit family. There's nothing that goes around that nobody does, that, that no one knows of. Everybody knows everything. And um, yeah, we had the support of my mom's family. And um, my mom is a real woman of substance. She raised us with, um, Jesus at the forefront, the very center of our lives. We were raised with, um, you know, watching her strong faith and never, never failing faith in Jesus. And no matter how hard things got, we knew that, you know, regardless, Jesus was in control. God was the center of the head of our home. And that's how we were raised. And um, yeah, I was a little bit, I was a naughty kid. <laughs> and um and uh, always the best teachers they're always the yeah. naughty kids you know because they understand the naughty kids in class <laughs> yeah, yeah I kind of um growing up I think going through my teenage years I kind of was a bit of a rebel with no cause um started questioning a lot about our faith and looking obviously learning more about my surroundings and living in apartheid South Africa and the unfairness of worshiping a white god, if mm. I can say that. Mm. Yep. Yep. Um, you can. Yep. You can definitely. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I rebelled. Uh, re became a real rebel in terms of my spirituality. I was just looking back. I was questioning and finding my way. But for my mom, I think it got her fears, her fear gripped her. I was here as a child that she looked at. She didn't look at me uh, looking for God. She looked at it rather than walking away from God. Yeah. So yeah. as a result, you know, I used to have the a deacon and the pastor of our church come home <laughs> quite often to have a chat with me. And... Um, 
and to make mm -hmm. it <laughs> and to make it a lot worse in that I met Gavin when I was 16 years old and uh, instantly knew that this was the man I was going to spend the rest of my <laughs> life with. Oh, bless. Sorry, that's super cute. <laughs> Because because God told you, right, Paula? No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, I think I have to be honest. I think it was the motor motorbike and the bad boy. Look. <laughs> the leather jacket. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and honest, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I met Gavin when I was 16, and uh, our friends, our family became friends, but Gavin was Hindu. So, yeah. So, wow. Um, that must have been it, scary for your mum, for you very, to not be falling in love with a Hindu boy. Yeah, for my mom. Yeah. And for my family and um, church they and love everyone except you. Because, <laughs> yeah. can, yeah. can I ask a couple of clarifying questions there? Yeah. Like, so within the South African Indian community, there's obviously people even under apartheid, you know, experiencing relative freedom to live based in their culture and in their religion. Is that correct? Like, you know, for, for both mm -hmm. of you? Yeah. But there was like obviously Christian circles, like um, in Christian context there within that yeah. as well. Like, yeah. go on, Christine. Sorry, so, yeah. would the, so would your church be Indian Christian? There wouldn't be yes. white yes. Christian and black no. Christian and Indian. So no. it's definitely still separate. Yeah. Separate. Right. Yes. Okay. Even within faith circles. Even yeah. within faith. So, so right. if, if I can come in now and just yes, you give can. you some context. Uh, so South Africa, well, the, yeah, South Africa was colonized by the Dutch in 1652 because what was happening was that the European traders were coming around the coast of Africa and going across to the east for spice, well, the spice route and the spice trade. And so those journeys and back in those days was so long that they uh, had to find a way of getting a refreshment station. And so they decided to colonize uh, the Cape, uh, uh, which is the tip of Africa and make that their halfway stop. And so, so it became a Dutch colony and then later, much later it became a, a British colony. Um, but uh, to put it into context, how people of Indian origin got to South Africa was uh, the British, when they arrived on the east coast of, of South Africa, and they colonized that part, uh, they, won, they found out that the weather was really good. It was subtropical, and it was perfect for growing sugarcane. And so they wanted labor. They wanted laborers because they didn't, didn't want to do the work themselves. And so they looked at the local people called the Zulus. Um, and the Zulu, in Zulu culture, men don't work. They hunt and defend the tribe. The women actually work on the fields. And so the British realized that they didn't have labor. And so what they did was they looked at one of their colonies and one of the colonies at that time was India. And so what they did was they, they went to India and, and they literally lied to the Indians saying that we're gonna take you to this place far away on a ship. And when you get there, you're gonna live a in a beautiful land, we're going to give you lots of land to farm and you're going to have your own space and you can do whatever you want to. But it was all a big lie, just like slavery was a big lie. And uh, so our forefathers, Paula and my forefathers, were taken to South Africa to ba basically become laborers mm -hmm. where they worked on British farms for mm -hmm. up to 16 hours a day. Oh, and so that was uh, slave labor that wasn't paid labor, yeah, not paid labor. Okay. Uh, it was paid it was paid I so <laughs> i mean minimum pay right know, so was, yeah, yeah just above just what slave above. labor was considered yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so so that's the background of how we had the indian culture south african indian culture that jared was asking about earlier but to bring that into the mix um then we later on we had an, a, a change of government where um, we had the apartheid government that came into being. Uh, well, there was a party called the National Party that came into power. And so they, they believed in something called apartheid, which means to keep people apart. And was that the According Dutch to, government? Or so the British? It was, 
the appetite. Uh, was well, there was a well, Boer War in there somewhere, wasn't there? Yeah, well? yeah, yeah. That was between, <laughs> uh, yeah, the Boer War was Boer War was between the Dutch and the English. They were fighting right. over land. Mm. And then yeah. there was also the Zulu who owned the land that were trying to defend their land. And so yeah, it was a enough, big you know? mix, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, and, and the so, Indians are just sitting there going, we just wanted a farm. <laughs> yeah, we just wanted to do something quietly. Why would we come? Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. And um, so, um, yeah, and then the sad thing was that, so the National Party uh, was l much later. It was what we call an Afrikaans-speaking uh, party. So... Um, and they believed in separate uh, everything. So they separated people according to the, the color of their skin. And so um, we as so-called Indians were kept, were only allowed to live in a certain area. And if you were so-called black African, then you could live in a certain area. And if you were white South African, you could live in a certain area. Could I just, and, could, what, what date is that around? Just for the people who are um watching because that's not the 1600s is it that's the so that, like no that's that's the 1940s yeah that wasn't so that, that long happened, ago yeah that, that is not that long ago no. so mm. that was the 1940s uh, but they they were very good at how the uh, we call it the architects of apartheid they were very good at how they did this because they passed laws or brought laws into into being where uh they did they, they uh you were not allowed to marry across color line so in other words uh, a, a black person could marry a white person mm -hmm. uh, you were not allowed to go to the same schools you could not uh, go on the same public transport you were not allowed to go to the same restaurants swim same you couldn't pool. swim in the same pool oh it was so hilarious that even the ocean was separated seriously so, they're not even allowed in the same bit of water yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you were uh, if you were a South African Indian, you had to go to a South African Indian beach, which was ridiculous because it's the same ocean. And yeah, so, but... I don't yeah, know. I, know. It's on, it's on <laughs> I was ten years old, and I asked my dad. We went. We took a drive uh, along the beach, and I asked my dad if I could go for the swim, and he said to me, "No, son, we can't because this is a whites only beach," and I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, well, the term that they use wasn't whites. They use whites, or sometimes they said Europeans only. And uh, so, or they use the how term. How do you explain that to your kids? I mean, how do you tell your kids that they're not seen as the same? Like, how, how do you, as a kid, understand this? Because I was a kid mm. and I didn't understand this. No. The sad thing was that my grandfather owned a huge property. He was a very prosperous businessman. And then in the 1960s, uh, his whole family were literally removed from their property because they passed a law called the Group Areas Act, where um, certain areas were now declared white areas and certain areas were black and certain areas were whatever. And what and the so, better areas, the white areas? Just oh, out of, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, my grandfather right, yeah. owned, owned the prime land and our family lost our entire wealth because the government just took everything away from us and, and basically sent us to a little dingy little place to go and live. So that is my memory of starting life in South Africa. Um, and um, it, was, it, was, it wasn't the best. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, you and I, Christine, could not have been friends then uh, because it was not allowed. So it's, um, it's, it's crazy. I mean, like just uh, my my family um, has been in New Zealand since white people came to New Zealand, basically. But we were right. also responsible for owning land that was already owned by um, the Maori yeah. people, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and I look at this now and I'm horrified as you know, my mum is British, British, she's from England, and my dad is European Kiwi and, and I look at it and I'm just like, I don't understand how my ancestors thought that somebody I can chat to, like you guys was somehow less than them, you know, like, I just don't even understand. It's so well, it's horrific to me that people can it, be treated it, it is like horrific that. Because, because one group of people felt that they were superior to another yeah. group of people. Mm. That's the basis yeah. of it all. 
And it makes me ashamed to like, I know it's not my fault, but it makes no. me ashamed that I come yes. from that history. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it does make me go, oh, my people got it seriously screwed up. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah. So well, especially that's when my own personal apology. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's both over a disclaim that I eh? like, we oh, are just... sorry for our parts. It's like, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, especially the stuff where it's done in the name of Christianity as well. Like that's really ah. particularly ugly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Jared, you brought up an important point. So, um, I, you know, like Paula said, I was born into a Hindu family, and I always say to people, it wasn't my choice. It was the family that I was born into, and the faith that I was born into. Yep. And uh, so that was my normal. Um, but when I was seven years old, my best friend Lazarus invited me to church. And he came and asked my mom. His name was mom, Lazarus. Lazarus, yeah. Yep. Actually, Lazarus. Yep. That's the coolest. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's awesome. Fantastic. We're still best mates until today. And so he cool. came He came to my mom and he asked me, uh, asked my mom to uh, if, he, if I could come to church. And my mom said, absolutely, you, you should take Gavin. And she wasn't. I was raised in a family where we were taught about other religions. Um, and we were taught to understand and tolerate other religions and not not to point fingers. In fact, Paula and I were having a conversation about that earlier today, about the fact that uh, when you actually learn about other rel religions, you actually understand where they're coming from. You don't have Absolutely. to agree with them, yeah. but you actually yeah. understand them better. Yeah. Do you think, um, is that part of... Um, Hindu culture and the fact that there are many gods in Hindu religion does that make yeah. it more accepting of listening to other people's religions or was that just a particular thing for your family yeah I'd, I just have to clarify something because there's also a misconception I mean me being a Hindu growing up in that um, so in Hinduism when they talk about many gods they actually what they're actually referring to is the many aspects of god so oh, you have to, i thought it was actually yeah. lots of different gods no well, so what happened oh. was they they if you if you understand the history of hinduism it started 5000 bc so uh basically it's a very very old uh, religion and back in those days there was no proper schooling there was no proper education so the people or the priests had to try and get people to understand how god operated so god would uh, give you god was responsible for let's say your prosperity or god would be re responsible for peace or whatever it might be and so they created these images mm. which actually represented the aspects of god and okay. so yeah so so right. that's where it actually comes from but uh, you are right because my mom was a devout hindu but she had a bible uh, next to her bed and she yeah. would read the yeah. bible regularly and yeah. so I grew up in uh, with that. So I yeah. grew up, I grew up knowing about Jesus, but I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. If that makes yeah. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think so there are I a lot of people who grow up in churches who grow up knowing about Jesus and don't know yeah. Jesus. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I mean I loved going to church as a child. I loved going to Sunday school, singing the songs. Um, but like I'm saying, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but I knew yeah. about him. I, yeah. If you ask me, I, I mean, I actually read most of the stories of the Bible by the age of 10. Wow. So, yeah, so I, I knew the Bible. God but, was hunting you down, wasn't he? Ah, from a very early age, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He However, was like, that Paula, was... she's going off the rails. We need Gavin. Come on, Gavin. <laughs> uh, I think the problem was that my introduction to Christianity was not the best one because the church that I went to, um, they preached mostly the fear of God more than the love of God. Right. And so it was like, if you, do, if you do this, you'll go to hell. If you do this, you'll go to heaven kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so me and my tiny little head at, at seven years old, I'm trying to like, oh God, this God is going to send me to this bad place and I'm going to burn. And so like, I was, yeah, I was literally, literally terrified at that stage. I didn't understand it, you know. Yeah. So then how old were you when you met Paula? Were you about 16 as well? Were you guys the same? <laughs> no. My friends, <laughs> I, no, I shouldn't say this on here. Okay, uh, so I was 22. Oh, 
<laughs> Look, I met my husband when I was 26 and he was 18. So it's fine. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, my friends were teasing me and calling me a, a cradle snatcher. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 16. Um, it's a little bit. You may or may not you have already talked to this a little bit, Paula, but I'm wondering, like, uh, if you. Uh, if your situation of actually growing up in that kind of context, we were talking about apartheid before, was it similar? Was it dissimilar? Completely different, you know, to Gavin's? What could you tell us about your experience of growing up in that context? So um, Gav's family and my family were really, really different. Obviously not in just religious wise. They were, I think Gavin's family were very politically aware of a lot of stuff in the uh, things were very much in the open where they discussed and argued different points and um, it was almost like a encouraged you know healthy I grew up in uh, like I said quite an orthodox kind of family we weren't um kind of allowed to uh, question. question. And I remember as a little girl, um, for me, lots of things were quite normal. Like I never thought about apartheid for a long time as a little girl. It never really, um, I just thought that's the way life was, you know, that that's what I was born into. And because of not being around, nobody really discussed stuff with us. Um, especially when it came to politics, politics. and whatever. So mm. um, one of my first or earliest memories of um, uh, apartheid was when I, um, I must have been probably about six or seven. We went to this place and in, in the city, like something like Rainbow's End. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, we were walking around and there were these lovely paddling pools, like uh, beautiful. beautiful pools on this esplanade kind of beachfront. And I was walking with my mom and dad. My dad was still with us at this point. And these children frolicking in those pool and, you know, the sound of laughter in summertime. And I said, uh, dad you know can I I want to go swim I want to go and play in those pools and he said um, oh you're not allowed to look at this sign and there was this big sign that said European children only and um, I couldn't understand it and I said can why dad why and he said no nope, that's just the way it is don't question so I kind of, you know, forgot about it and went on and went on with life. And obviously being at high school, certain things were, uh, we would, were discussed about, you know, in, in English, they would speak about um, the situation. And then I learned about Nelson Mandela at that stage and all of that. And that was usually a, quite an impressionable time in my life that I met Gavin. And then Gavin kind of, Gavin's family rather, introduced me to this whole new way of questioning and asking and probing for answers, you know, and being told the truth and being, being you know, so open about it. And in my final year at school, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Okay. So, it was, so it was mm. epic. Yeah. It was really, yeah. really epic. And we all watched it on TV about him, you know, coming out. Of, it was just momentous. Mm. And um, I think with Gavin's dad used to often encourage me, say, say how you feel, say it, speak it, speak it honestly. Don't cry because crying is sometimes seen as a point of weakness and you can't get your words out if you cry. So tell me how you feel. Disagree with me, shout at me if you have to, but tell me how you feel, you know? Wow. And so I was suddenly in this home that was, it was okay to question. It wasn't yeah. looked at as being disrespectful that I'm questioning stuff. And, and that my opinion mattered and I kind of found my voice and 
in, in that process of finding my voice and being suddenly aware of the world around me and the inequalities that I that was suddenly like in my face, I kind of started to feel, how is it that I can worship Jesus? How is it that I can have this great faith like my ma tells me all the time, put Jesus first, don't question, you know, Jesus is God and Jesus loves you. And then I think, but hang on a sec, how the apartheid government tells me that they are the privileged few and in in my head mm. growing up i almost felt like white people were superior to me mm. that's how mm. in my little kid brain growing up i felt like white they were the chosen people you know they mm. were beautiful and uh, if you didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes then of course you didn't fit in that you know, mm, what was yeah. perceived to be beautiful. And then going through all of this and then suddenly being made aware of my eyes being open as to what was going on around us in South Africa, I kind of had this thing, how does Jesus love me if he's this, if he's this God that loves all his people equally? Mm. How, how does that fit in how can he love only some of his creation and not others or how does he love white people more than he loves black people or brown people and then suddenly I kind of felt I actually don't want to belong I actually don't want to be a Christian I don't mm -hmm. want to have um, this faith in Jesus because how fair is it you know mm -hmm. And suddenly it was like I was just thrown into this kind of, I don't know, questions and answers. And mm. then, of course, the more I was questioning and seeking, the more my, my mom was suddenly afraid. And then the elders of the church would come and talk to me. And I, in my head, I think I actually don't want anything to do with this. Mm. You know? Yeah. It's so... Like, um, wow, I feel I so understand your heart, Paula, but it's like, it's so, it so saddens me that like, you know, this is a portrayal of Jesus in, in our day and age today. It's like, you know, the colonial God. And it's mm. like, it's, it's not our Jesus. It's not our Jesus. Oh, yeah. It's just, he, he, he so loves. And it's like, and it's like, I've got mm. nothing but empathy for your perspective. It's oh. like, you know, it's so sad that that was, you know, Understandably, how it was taught, how it was, taught, yeah. how it was portrayed, you know, what you've mm. been brought up with. Like, it's tragic. It's, it really is. Whereas, church was, it's, it's like you fear God, you're mm -hmm. going to burn in hell. That was what I was raised with. Mm. So, for the child that's impressionable and never allowed to question, never allowed mm. to question the why things were not being told, you know, we have this God who has such empathy and love for people and that and that it he gives us free will people have messed it up you mm -hmm. know they've made wrong choices but that's not because jesus doesn't love you i was never told that i was jesus was not seen to me as i was just seen as if i do wrong i'm gonna burn in the hellfire that mm. was my you know yeah. and yeah. and that's it and there's no there's no going back. There's no second chances for me, yeah. you know? And um, so I yeah. think that's where I reached my crossroads in my faith. And of course, having an older boyfriend who was so politically <laughs> aware of everything. Oh my God. It just kind uh, of almost. A bad boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I re re rebelled more. Yeah. because I suddenly was so impressionable with all the things that, that he would say mm. and then his family was so political and his uncle had to leave South Africa because of the political situation wow. and they had all of this background mm. information yeah. and yeah I, I so, just I just um, I love that because it's like oh our wonderful sneaky god who obviously brought you two together and yeah. had another plan <laughs> you know you're absolutely right yeah and one thing i learned about and 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 do understand now about mm -hmm. god is that i always say he we are not meant to see the big picture 
we are meant to see up to a certain point he sees the big picture yes. so so what you're saying about paul and i getting together and and going on this journey it was his plan already he had that plan in mind like when lazarus took me to church the first time that those plans were set in set before uh, before i even knew it mm. and so um sorry uh, yeah, i interrupted I think, you gave you, you you go ahead sorry <laughs> no no it's good so i just want to add on to what paula said um, so for me, I, I think I can talk as a person uh, who was not a Christian and now is a Christian. So I see I can talk from two points of view mm. uh, and like uh, being not a Christian and looking at Christians and then being a Christian and looking at non-Christians. You know, that yeah. I can see both sides of the story. Yeah. Um, one of the things that intrigued me and, and troubled me for many years was, number one, what Paula mentioned, that the government that we had of the day, the apartheid government, uh, they were actually a Christian government. So when they when they uh, met at parliament, they actually opened like their Christian? meetings. Christian? Christian, yeah. Christian, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the thing was they opened in prayer in, and, and being Christians, that's what they prayed. And, I, and, and me as a non-Christian, I was thinking, because I'd, I'd been reading up quite a bit, and I was thinking to myself, how can you call yourself a Christian government if you do not follow the basic teachings of, of, of uh, God, which is love one mm -hmm. another? Mm -hmm. So how can you say, call yourself a Christian, but you don't practice what you preach? So for me, that didn't make sense. So that was one of the first, my first encounters, like, and eh, this Christianity thing, Christianity thing for me doesn't work because they say one thing, but they do something else. So their actions don't match what they say. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first encounter. My second encounter was the fact that there were a lot of people that were sent as missionaries. And unfortunately, they as well, not knowing, unknowingly, I mean, they really, really loved what they did and wanted to spread the word, word, of, word of God. But in doing that, they believed they had to civilize or culture the people that they were coming into contact yeah. with. Yeah. And, and yeah. not realizing that, no, you don't need to do that. You need to actually embrace the culture of the people that you want yeah. to want you, uh, 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 to get to know God. So, so they didn't understand that. And they came with their sort of Western um, glasses and yeah. their Western ideas. And then basically pushed it upon these people and said this is what you should be doing and so yeah. basically there was a big problem where there was people didn't understand the difference between culture and religion and yeah. so it, so people became uh, embarrassed of their culture mm -hmm. because if you became christian then you had to throw out your culture your indian culture or your african culture or whatever culture you belong to Mm. So, because of I don't, I don't I'm not saying the missionaries were bad people, but they didn't no. understand no. at that yeah. time the damage they were doing. Yes. Yeah, yes. I mean it was and how so, they were taught to yeah. to spread the gospel, and they did it. I think a lot of them with with very genuine faith. Um, oh no, absolutely, and absolutely. very bad I mean, teaching. <laughs> yeah, you can put it that way. So they, they meant good, but it, it didn't yeah. it didn't work out. And so I think me being a non-Christian watching that happen, and like Paula said, uh, I came from a family where we we were very well read. My dad got up every morning at four o'clock and read from four to six o'clock, and then he would get up to get to work. And so, like Paula said, we were encouraged. We used to sit and debate every night. It could be on any topic. And like Paula said earlier, you had to, if you believed in something, you had to stand up and fight for what you believed in. Uh, you, it so sounds like a if, great if you, family. You, oh, it was great because- I want to uh, join. We would, <laughs> we would, we'd get to a point where we'd be like shouting on top of our voice and my dad would say, listen, you don't need to shout. If you want to make a point, this is how you, you just calm down and make your point. And we all listening to you because we'd get so heated about, I mean, every person wants to, you know, sincerely believes in what they want to say. And, 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 and so it was very interesting. Um, and then uh, also the other thing was that, yeah, my, my family was very political in the sense that we were very much aware of what was happening and the inequalities in our society and the damage it was doing to people. Mm. And, um, 
And for that reason, my dad's brother had to leave South Africa because it became so unsafe that if you were considered a threat to the government, then you would basically be um, imprisoned or you would very quietly or suddenly disappear. disappear mm -hmm. And no one would know anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so my one memory that I can share with you today is I was at university and I was uh, riding my motorbike to university and uh, it was during the student revolutions in South Africa where mm -hmm. the students were revolting against the, uh, the separate education system uh -huh. because every, uh, like we said, uh, every race group was taught different education. And, and they deliberately did that because white or European people were geared to become um, the, um, the uh, professionals and uh, the managers and, and, and the CEOs. And uh -huh. then the other people were then either trained to become skilled laborers or, uh -huh. or become unskilled laborers. And so, so uh, me as a student in high school and in university, I was fighting against the system where there was no equal opportunities for people of color. And uh, I was riding my motorbike one morning to university and I got stopped by the army. And uh, I had a backpack that I, I used to show, a shoulder bag uh, that I had on. And uh, the soldier pulled me over and uh, I just clearly remember the cold metal against my, the temple of my forehead. He had a, a rifle against my forehead and he said, get off your motorbike. And so I got off my motorbike and they uh, literally pulled my, yanked my, uh, my uh, backpack off my shoulders and uh, emptied out the contents of my bag on the, on, the, on the roadside. And what happened was a week or two earlier, I had actually attended a meeting at university and it was a meeting held uh, by a group of people called the Black uh, Consciousness Movement. It was started by a man called Star Steve Biko. And he was one of the, Steve Biko, and he was one of the people who mysteriously dis disappeared, you know, and right. was uh, and then died, uh, unfortunately, um, here. But it's very questionable. Um, but what happened was I went to that meeting, and they were handing out stickers, and then there was a sticker of of the the first. Yeah. which was the black power fair. yeah and mm -hmm. i just i never thought anything about it i took the stick and i put it onto my file and uh and the next thing these soldiers like they saw this file and said, yeah yeah see he is one of them he's a traitor he's a traitor to our government and he needs to be put into prison and i was thinking to myself oh no this is horrible this is going wrong because you must have been terrified law, yeah definitely i was terrified because the law was that you could be you could be detained for up to 180 days in detention without your family being informed so you you would disappear what? yeah that was that's the law. crazy that's nuts and so so friends of mine actually disappeared and we're not here for three months you would not hear anything from you know you you'd not hear anything about them you did nobody knew where they were and so that's what i thought was going to happen but i was very fortunate that they asked me to remove the sticker and uh never to go to those meetings again uh, i had to promise them kind of and and then they let me go off but did you go yeah, to the so, meetings yeah i still did yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> wow I, I, wow I, I, I didn't get i didn't take any stickers <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> lesson learned lesson yeah. learned <laughs> wow no evidence. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, what a what an amazing, what an incredible context to actually grow up in. Because it's like I'm confronted often when I think about you two as a couple, and it's like there's real depth there. You know, like your your calm, your your beautiful exteriors, like uh, show that that soulful depth. You know, that obviously some of these circumstances and growing up in these circumstances. Uh, obviously there's been a lot of work done spiritually to actually form you into the kind of people that you are. Um, yep. But I'm really curious about like, you know, one of the other things that have really like inspired me about your story is just like, you know, your, your relational journey and your intimacy and your marriage journey. Like I love like, hearing, you know, via the odd devotions, the stuff you've told us about actually how you've grown as a couple as well. Um, yeah. I, I love that romantic side of actually you getting to know each other uh and for 
Paulo with such freedom as well um, coming into that context. Um, I'm also reminded of actually just like, yeah, just the, the merging of families and some of those dynamics is actually, you know, moving into the marital bliss as well <laughs> in some of the, yeah. that season. I, I'm yes, wondering, so, go on, go on, Christine. Sorry. No, 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 I was going to say, how old, how old were you when you got married? 22. Wow, okay. Definitely. So, yeah. 29. 29. 29. <laughs> so, so, so to put it in the context, Christine, Paula's mom, when I approached her, so I, 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 I actually went up to Paula's mom and I said, listen, I'm interested in your daughter and I would like to, you know, date her. And, um, and she asked me, she said to me, Gavin, do you realize my daughter's still a teenager? Okay. She's a baby. Yeah. And I said, yes, I do. And she said, well, what makes you want to do this? And I said, listen, the first time I met her and I looked across the room, I was busy chatting with her. Um, something in my mind or, or something in my spirit said to me that this is the woman that you should spend the rest of your life with. And I know it sounds it sounds a bit corny, but it's true. No, it's adorable. Um, so corny. <laughs> and so, but I, I went home that night and I was battling with this whole thing because yeah, I was at university mm. at the motorbike, lots of girls, and you know, oh. I, no. <laughs> I don't have lots of girls. Lots of girls as friends, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like. But I was struggling in my mind, how do I actually now, it doesn't make sense, you know, in, in, in the real world, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, I also said to myself, if I let this opportunity go, I might regret it for the rest of my life. Right. And so, so I decided to actually go to Paul's mom and, and, and just pour my heart out to her. And mm -hmm. I, I did that. And but she it, said to me, listen, yeah. It, I mean, it's so curious because like, didn't Paula have like a similar kind of experience though as well like is, is that true yeah, Paula, or? you were saying you looked at him and when yeah. this is the man i just love that it's just yeah. so cute yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fairy tale <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah so, go on sorry so paula's mom said to me listen gavin uh i just want to let you know that my daughter needs to grow up she needs to actually experience life and i said um and she asked me are you are you prepared to to wait for her and I said, absolutely, I am prepared to wait for her. And he said, and she said to me, if you are prepared to wait for her, then it'll be fine. In in about whatever number of years time, uh, you've actually uh, you know uh, managed to to wait that long, then then it will be. But if you can't wait, then you know you might as well. Sort so of that was really on. seven years, which is so biblical, isn't it? I mean, you were your Jacob <laughs> yeah. waiting for your Rachel. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But at least, at least I got Paula. Poor Jacob didn't get. That. Yeah, that's true. He got Leah first. So yeah, I mean, there's not there's another not sister or something here. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So were you were you still Hindu when you got married? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that that was the most interesting thing because we wanted to get married, and so the whole thing was our families loved each other. We. I mean, we, Paula's mom loved me. She didn't love mm. the fact that I was not Christian, but she loved the fact that she loved me as a person, Gavin. If you and, do say uh, so yourself. That's <laughs> all the same. I loved, I, loved her as, I loved her. And yeah, it was so, so religion was like sort of always in the background kind of thing. Mm. And then when we decided to get married, it, it actually now became part of the foreground. Mm. And so we had to have discussions about how we were going to get married. And so... Paula, I said to her, listen, I, I know you're strong in your faith and I, I wouldn't want you to get married in a Hindu way. But at the same time, can you respect me? Because I'm not a Christian and I wouldn't want to be, I think it would be a mockery if I'm standing in church and getting married to you, but I'm not actually meaning it. It's not coming from my heart. Yeah. And so, so I said, can't we kind of find a sort of a neutral ground in which we can get married? Uh, that started <laughs> started a bit of a war. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I like I think when Gav spoke to my mom and asked her about uh, dating me, she said to him, "You do know that we're Christian." Mm. And at the time, Gav just said, "Yeah, you know, I I understand that." But I think how that came across to her was that I'll have no problem being a Christian when it comes to it. 
Right. Mm. But that's how it, that's, that's how she saw it when he said he understood. Right. So uh, our families became very, very good friends. We socialized. We did everything together. It was mm. more just a really beautiful friendship that was developing between Gav and I. You know, I was just in awe of everything that he said and did because he was this older person. And I think and of course also, you still are. I mean, everything. <laughs> and, and I think also like we look back, you know, looking, going through marriage count, you know, we did lots of marriage courses together. Mm. And, um, and I look at it now and I think, you know, um, Gavin being so much older than me I think the one counselor was saying something about it's got a lot to do with the fact that my dad left when I was very young so I kind of that was one of the attraction attractiveness of Gavin mm -hmm. and that he was older and that he he babied me a lot you know mm -hmm. kind of I got this love as a boyfriend but also he was fulfilling almost like a father's love you know mm, mm. that makes any sense in some yep. perverted way <laughs> no 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 it totally makes sense yep yep mm. and um yeah so when he said so my mom said you know you're going into this Gavin and you stand stand the most to lose because if Paula comes to a point where when she's 18 she might not like the same things that she likes now are you mm. prepared to invest in this mm. and then still come out the loser and he mm. said yes mm. wow. and and in that time uh, culturally now I say speak if a boy comes home and addresses the mom and dad it's a given it's looked on at that time not now so mm. much yeah. at that time it's looked on I have serious intentions with your daughter and those serious intentions are marriage. And I'm giving you yeah. my word. And I'm giving you my word that I'm coming to your home and I'm asking for her and he'll bring his family with him and they yeah. bring you a little gift or something. And that is to say, you know what? She's spoken for. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's, that, that's my promise. I mean, it's mm. touched as like, you know, maybe old fashioned, you know, at, you know, at best and maybe patriarchal at worst but i think there's a beauty to the way in which that's actually done in some oh, respects yeah. because yeah. there's actually a real kind of reverence and caring for and it's actually in in terms of if you really love someone are you willing to pursue are you willing to wait yeah. are you willing to better yourself are you willing to give them the space for them to better themselves you know mm. grow and develop not only as individuals but as a couple like there's yeah, yeah i think there's definitely some very biblical elements, biblical parallels there, and actually in mm. how uh, yeah. covenant monogamy and like courtship is done. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So, so when you were um, going to get married, and obviously, you know, the Christian stuff caused a bit of issues on your side. Were what about your family, Gavin? Were they mm. at all like we want a Hindu marriage? Like mm. what is well, happening here? And yeah, yeah, they were similar because my, well, I lost my mom passed away when I was 16 years old. So it was just my oh. dad. And yeah. then Paula just had a mum. Uh and so yeah, it was a battle of the worlds as I would say. Um you know, my dad wanted the Hindu wedding and, and her mom and, and my aunties and uncles. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and Paula's Can't forget family all the wanted, aunties and uncles, gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Paula's family wanted the, the Christian wedding where she wore the white gown and walked down the aisle and kind of thing. And like, eventually uh, we had to come to a compromise and then we had to, uh, we actually had to find someone who would marry us because back those days, uh nobody would want to marry a christian and a non-christian uh let me put you in previously in an indian marriage if you were a christian and the groom was hindu you converted you followed right. his way right if he was if he was christian and i was hindu then i had to con follow it but right. gav and i decided that that was not, not going to work for us yeah. well, because okay. i'm not prepared to be yeah. hindu and he wasn't prepared to be a christian 
So mm. we looked for people. Uh, all the Hindu priests said, no, they can't marry us. It's not going to work. All the Christian, all the pastors said, no, nope. nope. they can't marry us. It's not going to work. So wow. yeah. at the time I was attending, I used to go to a Presbyterian church and mm. I just found I think I found my faith there and that mm. I just fell in love with the people mm. and it was a predominantly white church mm. with very old people in yeah. that church but I just kind of I formed these lovely bonds and relationships with them and the and reverend um Ron, he was just my favorite you know and he said I would marry you darling but I'm away on conference so he said let me speak to my friend mm. and um uh, reverend david duncanson was mm. a pastor in the congregational church and he said i won't marry them until they come for counseling, for, for counseling. they come to me and i see them a few times and then mm. i'll decide can i can i if, if you don't mind me teasing that out a little no. bit like what what was it that enabled you to kind of come to this place? Like, I think I can kind of understand some of those reasons, but that you were so ardent about like, no, we're going to respect each other's worldviews. We're not going to, yeah. you know, allow each other to compromise, but like, we still want to go ahead and actually proceed in this yeah. way. Can, can you tease that out a little bit for us? Like how you came to that place particularly? Because that's got to be hard. Yeah. it is. I think for me, it was much easier because I came from a family of, where I was taught tolerance and taught to respect and understand, uh, you know, other religions. So I had, mm. I grew up in a college, well, in a family where we had Muslim friends and we had, um, you know, uh, Jewish friends and all kinds of friends, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't really matter. It was mm. the people that mattered, not mm. the religion. Mm. And so for me, it was kind of easier because I, I didn't want to, like being the male, I'm supposed to now ask Paula to follow me. Mm. And now I'm, I'm going against the, the standard of society mm. and saying, no, 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 I want you to be a Christian because that is your faith and that is what you believe in. I mm. want you to remain who you are. I don't want to change that about you. So um, that was very interesting. And I think the same thing about Paula, she realized that if I was going to do it, I wasn't going to do it because I wanted to do it, but I was going to do it because she wanted me to do it. And then mm. that would be the wrong reason as well. Which is fantastic, I have to say. Like, there are so, there are a number of couples yeah. that I can think of that I won't <laughs> name at all, but um, who, who, you know, they really struggle with that. They're dating mm. somebody who is a non Christian or, or whatever. And, and most of the people in their lives are saying, break up because yeah. it's not going to work if you yeah. are the whole unequally yoked and all that kind of thing. Mm. Um, oh. And in many cases, I would I would agree with it and be like, you know, no, that's not going to work. And yet you guys made it work. And then God used that as well, which a lot of people, you know, it's the whole, people talk about date to save. Have you heard of that? Where a Christian convert. dates a non-Christian to like date yeah. to save them and bring them into, you know, and that kind of thing. And that's a really disingenuous way mm. of being in relationship. Yeah. And yet you guys didn't do that at all. But no. it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think my journey was a little bit different from Gab's in terms of when we eventually did uh, decide that we, we're going to get married because obviously this is this relationship was going on for quite a while you mm. know and um when gavin asked me to marry him on the one and i was super excited because all i ever really wanted to be was gavin's wife and i still maintain that i always say that you know that that for me was was the highlight yeah all i it, i used to say it to everybody all the time i just want to be gavin's wife that's all oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and, and, and i i was really torn because in that time that last year before we could get married 1994 i gave my heart to the lord like genuinely gave my heart to the lord and that mm. i found 
Gavin and I had gone through a really rocky part in our relationship where it was becoming a bit of a struggle, you know, this uh, trying to work around everybody and just, you know, growing up. And obviously my faith in Jesus was cemented where suddenly I found God and I found him for myself. Mm. And then inside of me, I said, but I love this man, Lord. And I've, I've given so much and I know that it's, I know I was not supposed to be unneedly yoked with him, but I know that after that verse, there's also that one verse that says that he will be covered mm. by my faith mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the Bible. <laughs> and and it wasn't as though I was taking it and making my own meaning is that I had already although I was a Christian I was not a believing Christian Christian Mm. is such a loose word I was not a believer of Jesus Mm. I didn't believe that he owned my soul yeah Mm. and Mm. so when I found him and suddenly everything impacted differently for me. And I said, Lord, I am in this relationship with this man whom I love. I've given myself to him. I've given, I've prom- I'm promised to him, you mm. know? And, mm. and I can't, I can't, I can't walk away now. Yeah. Not I can't. Yeah. And, and I can't, I didn't say I won't. I said, I can't. Yeah. And you were committed. I mean, that's seven years. Yeah. You were yeah. committed. That's not something you just walk away from. And so when we were getting, when we were working out the wedding, I prayed and I said, Lord, I want a man of God. I want someone who believes in Jesus to marry us, regardless of how, but I want it to be a man of the church. And Gav's uncle and Gav, they looked and looked and looked for a commissioner of oath you know, because that's what they wanted. They wanted somebody who was neither... Well, sort of a civil marriage. A civil marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they looked, and they looked, and they looked, and I said, Lord, they're not going to find that person. <laughs> they won't find it because I, God's going to grant me that desire that there will be a man of the church that will marry us and a reverend married us. And when we went for counseling, he asked Gavin, he said, if you can give me a man's word that you will not force Paula to do anything that, you know, any rituals or anything, you will not force her to give up her love for Jesus and her faith. If you can give me that promise as a man, then I will go ahead and I'll marry you after so many and then he yeah. spoke to us and then he also asked me um, he asked me uh so um have you ever thought about children and i said yep and then he said uh, so when your children are born what faith will they follow and i said listen between paula and i i i admire her because she's so strong in her faith and i would love for my, for my children to be christian and he said are you sure he said uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, I've, number one, I would never ever stop Paul from going to church. Number two, I'd love my children to be to be raised as Christians. And um, and so I, I made that promise there and then. And then years later, when our children, all three of our children were born, and when all three of them were born, I was not still not a Christian. I stood in front of a congregation at church and we dedicated our children and I promised the congregation that I would bring up my children as a Christian in the Christian faith. You know what? I reckon there were a whole bunch of Christians that were around you that were all going, God's got him. <laughs> we're just waiting. We're just waiting for time. <laughs>